the Tyndale House Greek New Testament has some features that you typically wouldn't find in a Greek New Testament. So I've got I've got three here um, that are rather interesting. They, we've got ekthesis, the, the book order, and uh, retaining spelling errors. So that that's interesting to me that that you would retain errors, <laughs> spelling errors in the text. I got I, I have to preface that spelling errors, not not errors, spelling errors. Um, but let's let's start with ekthesis. What is it, and why did you choose to put that in in the THGNT? So we tend to start a new paragraph with a, sm- a slight indentation. <laughs> of the text, Mm -hmm. either a tap space or so, and leave the preceding line uh, partially blank. How it happens almost universally in Greek manuscripts is by uh, what we have done in in the uh, Tindo House edition, by projecting the first letter of the new paragraph a little bit into the left margin. We didn't enlarge those letters, which quite often happened as well, uh, but we we just kept it the same size, but a little projection into uh, the left hand margin. And why did we do this? It's a very small thing, but it gives you a little bit more of a feel of what Greek manuscript actually looks like. And why would we impose our custom of marking paragraphs onto a Greek text, which clearly has a slightly different custom and which is easily understood by everyone? That was one of the reasons. Now, there are some positive effects of it as well. The positive effect is, is that the first word of a paragraph sticks out a little bit more. So if you open uh, any random opening in Gospel of Mark, for example, Mm. you will notice that most of these paragraphs will all start with kai, the most simple Greek word for and. Uh, And that is typical for Mark's style. He he connects sentences and paragraphs with and, and, and. That that is his favorite conjunction. If you compare that to Matthew, well, Matthew has a wider range of conjunctions, but has still a great preference for the word tota, then. And those are things that just jump off the page visually when you just follow the the habit as it was uh, in in the Greek manuscripts. I'm not aware of any other Greek New Testament published that does that. So that's interesting. But there, there is one in uh, the second section here. The, the thing about the book order is I think the Byzantine Greek New Testament, the Robinson uh, Pierpont edition, does the same thing. And to be honest, it kind of drives me nuts a little bit, right? Because when you're like trying to find a passage or something, you're like, oh, right, the Catholic epistles are over here. So about the book order, why did you choose to switch it up on everybody? Yeah, I'm glad you used the word retained <laughs> almost as an error in your question, <laughs> that, because I like those questions that answer themselves. The predominant order in the Greek manuscript tradition is in the you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Acts, and then the Catholic epistles, and then in the order, kind of James, Peter, uh, etc., the, the normal mm-hmm. order, and then the letters of Paul, and then close the, the canon with, with Revelation. Revelation. We didn't see any reason to change this. And then, of course, the question becomes interesting. But how did we end up with the order we have in our Bibles? That sounds like a new video at some point. (laughs) It it would be be very (laughs) interesting interesting, to to really dive into the reasons underneath. But as far as I can see that, okay, the order in which we have it nowadays was one of the orders available for Erasmus, who printed or who published his first Greek New Testament. Erasmus chose this order for reasons unknown to me, but uh, he may have had a very good reason for it. And that became therefore the standard order but it wasn't definitely not the standard order mm. in manuscripts so available in those days i wonder if the order changed this is just totally me randomly thinking about some of the history i know if it had something to do with the size of the catholic epistles versus the pauline epistles and then uh, getting it into the printers and running it off as quickly as he could i, I, I wonder if it's related to that i suppose you're, you're probably not going to be able to answer that but uh, just no just i won't be able to I answer wonder. that yeah, I wonder if there's some relation there. Well, there are a couple of answers that are wrong, in a sense. I have been thinking for a while that Erasmus simply used the uh, the standard Latin order. 
But it turned out that there are also a variety of Latin orders for the books of the New Testament sort of in, in those days. So that's not a fully satisfying answer either. Mm. It's also probably not the case because uh, to highlight Paul over against the other apostles. I'm not sure if that was a consideration for Erasmus. I could have seen that it could have been a consideration for a Protestant ordering yeah, yeah. of the books, but I don't think Erasmus would fall for that. So mm -hmm. yes, no, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. It's interesting that when you look at the Editio Critica Maior, you know, the big project to provide a complete overview of the textual development of the first thousand years, those big blue fat volumes, yeah. uh, they have decided to number their volumes in such a way that it will reflect the traditional Greek order and not the sort mm. of modern Western custom. Interesting. Orders. I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. All right. So let, that's book order. The third item here that I found interesting was that as an editorial decision, uh, you decided to retain anomalies in spelling. We'll just say it that way because it sounds more fancy. Anomalies in spelling. Why, why do you keep things that we might perceive as spelling errors in the text? Well, first of all, it helps you to get rid of the notion spelling error. Now, we, uh, yes, we, we very much insist on standardized spelling, etc. But it is doubtful that in the first century people had a strong concept of there's only one correct way to spell a word. There was always the influence of the oral pronunciation of words on how things were, were spelled. That's one thing. The other thing is everyone who is a bit in biblical languages knows that in the Hebrew Old Testament mm. inconsistent spelling happens all the time. We have plainer spellings of words, we have names written in various ways, etc. And nobody really lifts an eyebrow on, on the fact that that's happening in the Old Testament. I mean, that's how it's always been. So we accept it. Nobody is calling for a standardized spelled Old Testament. Right, right. And that, that was some of the same thing in some of our early English translations too, including the King James Version didn't necessarily have a, you know, a standard spelling for some words. And you see that get sort of fixed up as time goes on and more revisions come out, right? That's interesting in, in seeing that back in the in, in the manuscript tradition. But there is more to it. I mean, we think that spelling differences are meaningless. But that's, of course, perhaps an upfront conclusion. Spelling variants can be meaningful. I mean, certainly the medieval rabbis were discussing about whether plainer spellings of words made a difference or not, and why you know, Jeremiah went for the long spelling rather than the short spelling at, at one particular point. But in order to start asking those questions, you will need ha to have the material to work with it. And there was one interesting uh, phenomenon, which I don't blame the Nesselan 28 for, but I think it is uh, impoverishing the, uh, the conversation, is that they decided to spell the word for, uh, for the conjunction but, no, Allah, almost <clears throat> consistently full before a consonant and abbreviated to al before right. a vowel. That was an editorial decision, which actually did not reflect the manuscript tradition. I don't think there is any Greek manuscript that oh, actually does it that way, but it wasn't purely editorial decision. Huh. Now, we've tried to follow the manuscripts, and there are a couple of places where the word Allah is written in full before a vowel, not just in the early manuscripts, but also in the majority of the late manuscripts. So there is quite a large consensus for that spelling. The thing is is with the short form, form of Allah, Al, it has lost its accent. But right, what if, right. as a reader, you want to put an accent on Allah just for rhetorical reading purposes? Then you need to write it in full. And that is what you see exactly in, for example, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12 or thereabouts, where Paul has that uh, three times repeated Allah 
in the sense of, but you were justified, but right, you were cleansed, right. but you were. So for rhetorical effect, there was three times a vowel, but three times Allah written in full. So right. does that make a semantic difference? Yeah, yeah you can see there's field. an emphasis on that, right? There's That's an right. emphasis on referencing back to what you were and what you are now. And, and you get that more fuller, like I can see that now, you get that more fuller meaning when you have the entire word there as opposed to being bre- abbreviated. Now, um, this was an example, of course, where I could understand why it was happening. But then the question is, as an editor of a text, should I only include phenomena that I happen to understand? And then my, my answer is, of course, no, of course not. I just need to follow the evidence as best as I can. Yeah. Well, and the not answer sort could of be restricted to my understanding. Yeah, the, the answer could be yes, if you knew everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> good, good. So, so in talking about Allah uh, and, and I'll, whatever, uh, what about the word kego? Uh, K ego is is there a similar thing going on there or or uh... it might be and there is at times variation on it on the conjunction and I I think it it does something but what it does I don't know but but then again I hope to provide the raw materials for others to actually mm-hmm. investigate it another nice example mm-hmm. is the name Mary whether it is spelled in the Greek way Maria or in the mm-hmm. Aramaic transliterated one, Mariam. And it seems to me that that most often in the Gospels, there is variation, which at times seems to be untraceable. Why? But, and certainly scribes were, were quite often confused. But sometimes I think there, there is a difference. And this is a nice example where the Byzantine text has actually sort of over all four Gospels, again, a sort of executive decision that the form Mariam with the M is used for the mother of Mary and Maria without the M for any of the other Marys. Right. So you're, so you're saying that the uh, the Byzantine grouping has purposely edited that way to, to remove confusion from the text. Is that is that what you're saying there? Um, it seems to be to be yeah. the case. But at least they acknowledge that there is a distinction between the two forms. And that is, I think, what's heartwarming here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because you're you're kind of poking at me a little bit, right? Because I, I mentioned I'm a Byzantine guy in many, many places. Uh, so you're you're kind of challenging my thinking on that a little bit. I like it. it's good. Speaking of challenging and, and things of that nature, there there has been a little bit of criticism about the THGNT and it's uh, surrounding the apparatus. And many people, James Snap, one of them, and uh, Stephen has mentioned it a little bit, Stephen Hackett, friend of mine, Biblical Studies and Reviews, suggests that maybe the apparatus is a little bit too small to be useful. What was your purpose in the apparatus and how how would you respond to to such criticism? The thing is, of course, useful in in what terms? Right. Um, what, What we try to do is to put in the apparatus all those variants where there is still serious room for discussion, in our humble opinion, Mm -hmm. or just because the variation is very well known. And in that sense, we don't want the apparatus to be a distraction. We want the apparatus to give you sufficient information to read the text, to study the text, without getting sidetracked by all of that. Which means that in comparison to the Nestle Land, we, we have to be very rigorous. And of course, there are always on, on details that, yes, we should have included this variant. We could have left out that one, etc. There are very few word order variants in the apparatus, for example. On the other hand, it is what it is. And it's clearly mm-hmm. not intended that we, we want to be the addition that provides you with the best apparatus possible. We we tried to give you a good apparatus. So for many of the papyri, when only a partial word is is visible, then we give you actually the partial word. For every variant, we give you always the evidence for and against and not just sort of a negative apparatus. So in that sense, we tried to keep it as friendly and user-friendly as possible. With a project such as the Editio Critica Maior on the way, it would be, I think, a pointless kind of duplication of effort to, to try and do exactly the same. 
again. Okay. Well, very good. Very good. I like that. Uh, so the purpose is to focus on the text and not all on all of the, you know, the other stuff. I think I was reading an article just in, in kind of preparation for our talk here. And, and you had talked about wanting to minimize the editorial stuff within the text so that, you, you know, focus could be on what the Bible is actually saying and not all these little notes and, and symbols and stuff like that. There's merit to that because sometimes if I just want to sit there and read, it's just really annoying to see all the footnotes and all of the, you know, the, the superscripts and everything pointing you in all these different places. Um, so I, I totally get that. Mm -hmm.